Thank you. I know some other folks will probably join in, but I'm going to turn this over to our co-chair for the Government Affairs Committee, Teresa Acosta. The floor is yours. Great. Thank you so much. I'm happy to call this meeting to order. And as usual, we begin the meeting with a Pledge of Allegiance. Catherine, would you like to lead us in that? Yes. So please join me in the Pledge of Allegiance. Ready to begin. I pledge allegiance, pledge allegiance to the flag, flag of, the United of the United States, States of America, America and to the Republic, the Republic for, which for which it stands, stands one, nation, one nation, under God, under God indivisible, uh, indivisible, with liberty, with liberty and, and justice for all. all. Thank you. Thank you all. I know it can be a little bit awkward. And just as a reminder, when you're not speaking, please feel free to mute yourself. And when you are speaking, uh, we'll have you take responsibility for unmuting. Thank you. Um, we typically start our meeting with uh, introductions, self-introductions. Um, so I'm trying to pull up the agenda right here to make sure that I'm on. Yes, I am. Uh, so we'll go ahead. We have a we have a crowd that I think we can manage doing introductions. We do them very briefly. So this is your chamber 17 second self introduction. And then uh, we'll have you pass the baton on to the next person. So this is like a concentration game where you have to pay attention to who has or hasn't gone yet. So I'll start to give you an example of how this works and pass it along to the next person. Hi, my name is Teresa Acosta, president of Acosta and Partners consulting firm here in, in Carlsbad, and I am the chair, uh, co-chair of the Government Affairs Committee. Thank you for being here. Teresa Acosta, Acosta and Partners. I'll pass it along to Brett Schonsenbach. Good morning, everybody. Brett Schonsenbach, President and CEO of the Carlsbad Chamber of Commerce, and very happy to have you all join us today. I'm going to pass it on to uh, John Osborne. Uh, good morning, everyone. John Osborne. I'm Director of External Affairs for at and Great, and we'll pass it along to Chuck Barretts. Morning everybody, Chuck Barretts, Managing Partner at Cloudforia. We help get your businesses up in the Salesforce cloud so that your business can be accessible by any of your employees anywhere in the world. Chuck Barretts, Cloudforia. Let's hand it to uh, JR Phillips. Morning everyone, JR Phillips with Phillips and Company Real Estate. Um, good to see you all. Great, we'll pass it along to Haley. Good morning, I'm Haley Wansley with Intesa Communications Group and the Secretary for this committee. I will pass it along to Mr. Haney Hong. Well, good morning, folks. Haney Hong, I'm the President and Chief Executive Officer of the San Diego County Taxpayers Association. Thanks for having me again. Looking forward to our conversation. And uh, I'll play this game too. I'll pass it to Kelly Batten, but it's easy for me. <laughs> Thanks, I'm Kelly Batten, and I'm the Policy and Government Affairs Director with the San Diego County Taxpayers Association, and I will pass it to Risa Barron. Good morning, everyone. This is Risa Barron with the San Diego County Water Authority. Um, looking forward to our discussion today, and I will pass it along to Phil Urbana. Good morning, I'm Philip Urbina, uh, Opus Productivity Solutions, and we use online behavioral assessments to help companies an organization select the right person for the right job. And I will pass it along to John Dobkin. Hi, I'm John Dobkin, a public information officer with uh, the San Onofre Nuclear Generating Station in Southern California, Edison. And I will pass it to uh, Kathy. Good morning, I'm Kathy Steffen. I am the Director of Fun at the Carlsbad Chamber of Commerce and I will pass it on to Tamara. Tamara, you're on mute. Thank you. I'm Tamara Hodges, senior sales rep with the Juice Plus Company, trying to help people stay healthy. Great. And I'll, pass, I'll pass it on to Carl. Hi, good morning, everybody. I'm Carl Stryker. I'm with Prime Lending. I'm helping people finance their uh, home purchases and refinance with uh, Prime Lending. I'm Carl Stryker, and I will pass it off to Jim Harper. Good morning, everyone. Jim Harper, partner with Best Best and Krieger. I will pass it on to Deb Bedeau. Good 
Good morning, everyone. I'm Deb Beto, your ops manager, especially during this time of COVID. Strange times. Anyway, um, thank you for having this, continuing this meeting. I think it's really important, and I will pass it along to Wade Ashbrenner. Thanks, Deb. Wade Ashbrenner with Audeo Charter School, part of the Altus Charter School Networks. Again, Wade Ashbrenner, External Relations, Altus Schools. And I'll pass it over to Ben. Uh, good morning. Uh, my name is Ben Grief. I am here on behalf of the Schools and Communities First Initiative. Um, and who do we have we still not done? Maybe Teresa might be able to help me out. Yes, oh. sure. I'll pass it along for you. Uh, how you. about Todd Priest? Hi, good morning, everyone. I am Todd Priest with Todd Priest and Associates. We are a public affairs and government relations firm, and we are assisting Southern California Edison this morning. And I will pass it along <laughs> to Shirley Anderson. Hi, I'm Shirley Anderson. I am a Carlsbad resident. And I'm also representing the Democratic Club of Carlsbad Oceanside. And I'll pass it on to Lois Petter Bruce. Hi, good morning. Thank you, Shirley. I'm Lois Petter Bruce. I'm with Southern California Edison supporting Science Communications. And I'm going to pass it on to uh, Carl Streitner. Carl's already gone, but why don't we pass it along to Catherine Magania? Thanks. Good morning, I'm Kath Magania, a certified financial planner with WWM Financial and also a board member of the Chamber of Commerce. And I'll pass it along to Katie. We just lost Excellent. video on Katie. She might've stepped away. Oh. How about Jack Cumming? Uh, yes. I'm Jack Cumming and uh, I'm an actuary and I apologize for coming a little late, so I don't know who's been called. So I'll pass it back to Teresa to identify somebody who's awaiting recognition. Sure, there's a few people left. How about Jeff Bott? Good morning, everyone. Jeff Bott, Public Affairs for the Toll Roads. Um, how about Matthew Fye? Is he gone yet? Yeah, Matthew Fye with the Office of uh, Senator Pat Bates, and I will pass it along to Lynn. Hi, I'm Lynn Pittman with the North San Diego Small Business Development Center, hosted by Miracles College, providing small businesses with free business consulting and workshops at no cost. So far, we've helped over 8,000 businesses obtain 96 million in COVID disaster funding. Spread the word, contact us, and I'll put my information in the chat box. Thank you all for everything you're doing for small businesses. Thank you, Lynn. Let's pass it back to Katie Scanlon. Uh, you're on mute, Katie. No, no volume. Okay. She's not Katie. on mute, but her volume's not working. That's yeah. Katie Scanlon from SDGE. <laughs> yeah, we'll introduce her for, her for her. Okay, how about Jason Haber? Hey, good morning, everybody. Jason Haber, City of Carlsbad, City Manager's Office. Thank you. Uh, how about Manuel Camargo? It might be a sound or audio issue with him as well. Um, Kelly Batten, have you gone? You have? Okay. Um, anybody else raise your hand if you haven't gone yet? From a show of hands. Okay. I don't see anybody. Great. I think we covered it all. This is always a great way to see who's in the room figuratively, who's attending so that we know our audience and we feel um, that we can all speak up and ask questions. So thank you very much for being here and for participating in our uh, meeting today. The next thing on the agenda is the approval of minutes. Haley, do you want to lead us in that? To make the motion? Well, to ask, would anybody like to make a motion? <laughs> <laughs> would anyone like to make a motion to approve the minutes? I'll make a motion to approve the minutes. Thank you, Catherine. Do we have a second? Uh, wait. Second. Second. Uh, okay. Um, is that Phil? Yes. Yeah. Okay, great. Thank you. So we have a second. Uh, all in favor, raise your hand. Say aye. Uh, 
Okay. Right. It's easier if we do uh, <laughs> any opposed. No opposed. Okay. So the it looks like the minutes are approved unanimously with the exception of government offices and uh, government officials abstaining. Great. Thank you so much. Uh, it looks like we're ready to go on to our uh, new business topics and our guest speakers. We'll be starting today with John Dobkin, the PIO of uh, San Onofre Power Plant, and he'll be talking about the decommissioning of the plant. Thank you for being here, John. The floor is yours. All right. Thank you very much. Let me uh, share my uh, presentation here. Great. And as you're doing that, just a reminder to everyone who's, who is unmuted, please mute yourselves while John is speaking. Thank you so much. Okay. Hopefully uh, everyone can see that. Yes, we can. You're good, John. Great. Thank you. All right. Well, thank you uh, uh, for inviting us to speak and to tell you a little bit about what's happening uh, at, uh, at Songs now and, and what's going to be happening over the next several years. Um, just a little bit about myself. I've been uh, working at uh, San Onofre and for Southern California Edison for uh, about two years now. I joined uh, Songs in 2018. Uh, prior to that, I worked in, uh, at a nuclear plant up in Washington State, Columbia Generating Station, and uh, started my career in broadcast journalism after graduating from San Diego State, so Southern California native, and, uh, and happy to be back in the area. Um, in terms of uh, what I'm going to be talking about, um, we're really focusing on, on the decommissioning. So um, as we go through decommissioning, which is uh, what all nuclear plants go through after shutting down. Uh, we've developed these goals and principles that will help uh, guide us in, uh, in this journey that we're on. It's uh, going to be going on for, for quite some time. So in terms of uh, completing decommissioning, we're, we're dedicated to doing that in a safe, timely, transparent, and cost-efficient manner. Um, we've developed these three principles uh, that are guiding us in this project, which are safety, stewardship and engagement. So from safety, uh, that of course is our top priority and, and from a, a nuclear perspective, uh, there's a number of different aspects to that. So that means nuclear safety, radiological safety, industrial safety, and of course environmental safety. Those are all very important to us. In terms of stewardship, um, we're committed to leaving the community and the area better off uh, than we found it when we started songs about 50 years ago. Um, that's uh, how long uh, we've been uh, in the area in terms of uh, generating electricity. And in terms of engagement, that includes obviously uh, opportunities like this morning, um, but making sure that uh, we share with the community the plans that we have, the, uh, the work that we're doing, um, the uh, various uh, actions that are taking place on site, and uh, making sure people understand uh, exactly what's, what's going on uh, during this decommissioning. So um, while we were operating, obviously, uh, that was a, a very different posture uh, than what we're in now. And uh, I'll talk a little bit more about that uh, as we go on. So a little plant history. Um, there were three units at San Onofre. The first uh, unit Unit one came online in, uh, in 1968, so construction for that um, started in the, the late uh, or the early 1960s. Um, unit one was retired in 1992 and partially decommissioned. Units two and three uh, came online in 1983 and 1984, respectively. Uh, they were both retired in 2013, uh, following issues that we had with uh, replacement steam generators uh, at both units. So. Those, uh, those plants were retired in 2013. And basically, you know, at that point, uh, we decided that uh, the prompt decommissioning of the site uh, was the best path for us to take. In terms of spent fuel storage, uh, we've stored spent fuel on site for over 50 years. Um, we first put uh, spent nuclear fuel in the spent fuel pools in 1970. And, uh, and then we've had spent fuel in, in dry cask storage since 2003, and I'll uh, talk a little bit more about that as well. This is our decommissioning plan. So uh, depending on your monitor, it, uh, it may be hard to see, so I hope, hope uh, some of the type is a little small, but I hope everybody can kind of understand 
um, what this looks like. Um, NRC regulations allow for up to 60 years for a nuclear plant to decommission, um, basically uh, to uh, clean up the site and, uh, and restore it uh, back to a, a near original condition. So, um, but we believe that completing this work in a timely manner was uh, better for customers, local communities, and certainly the environment. And, and we had the, um, the funding to go ahead and start with decommissioning. And so that's, uh, that's what uh, Southern California Edison and the co-owners decided to do. Um, where we are right now is if you look at those first two dotted red lines, that's, that's where we fall right now. So we're uh, on the cusp of getting all fuel and dry storage. That will happen uh, this week, as a matter of fact. And, uh, and then following that, we'll start looking at beginning uh, what would be considered major decommissioning work, which is the dismantlement of the plant. Um, I'll also, uh, let me also talk about the, the all fuel and dry storage. Uh, you can see that long blue line there. Um, basically, there is no place right now, there's no federally licensed facility to move the fuel to. So uh, all nuclear plants uh, must store their uh, spent nuclear fuel on site. And that's what we're doing until a, uh, either an interim or a permanent uh, disposal site or repository is developed. So um, that's in our, our plan to safely store the fuel on site until that happens. And then once a site is open, begin the transfer process. We have 123 canisters of spent nuclear fuel on site. So uh, we'll need to ship each one of those to that location when it becomes available. And you can kind of see how that plays out in this timeline. Once all the fuel is gone, that's where we then uh, do the final uh, decommissioning of the site. Uh, we would then remove the spent fuel storage installation and uh, turn the site back over uh, to the US Navy, which is the, uh, the owner of the land. Uh, I mentioned uh, how, how we have uh, our decommissioning fully funded. So um, this is our, our decommissioning cost estimate. Uh, roughly $4.4 billion uh, budgeted for decommissioning. That money, we started a decommissioning fund in uh, around 1988. So uh, customers who received electricity from songs uh, paid in a little bit um, uh, every bill and that added up. And so about one third of this uh, $4.4 billion comes from customer contributions and two thirds comes from uh, investments that uh, built up over time to give us the, uh, the 4.4 billion. And, uh, and that's one of the reasons why the, uh, the Nuclear Regulatory Commission allows 60 years for decommissioning. Some nuclear plants uh, need time to build up their decommissioning funds uh, in order to, uh, to start decommissioning. We were uh, fully funded uh, from the get-go, so that's why prompt decommissioning uh, was a good idea. In terms of the, uh, the waste amounts that we're going to have from decommissioning, um, we have, uh, uh, obviously, it's a, uh, uh, a large site, um, a lot of steel and concrete. And so the, uh, the amount of material that we're going to be uh, taking off site uh, is going to be uh, rather, rather large. So a portion of the material uh, we'll be removing from the site will what is what's called low level waste, um, low level radiological waste. And most of that material is going to a uh, disposal site in Clive, Utah. Some of it will be going to a disposal site in Andrews, Texas. And then the, uh, the rest of the material, which is most of the material, which is basically landfill scrap metal, um, will be going to a uh, landfill in La Paz, Arizona. And again, most of that will be going by rail uh, rather, than, uh, rather than truck uh, to uh, minimize any traffic impacts there. And when I talk about all the stuff, if you've uh, ever had a chance to come out to Songs um, and see, uh, there's a lot of material there. So, you know, if you look at uh, some of these photos, uh, nuclear plants are very robust structures. Uh, they have a lot of concrete, a lot of steel. Um, all of this is going to be either 
cut up or broken down and then uh, gathered and safely transported off site. One of the projects that we just completed was the uh, transport of the uh, Unit 1 reactor pressure vessel uh, off site. So, this was one of our first major projects of decommissioning. This was a component uh, that housed the nuclear fuel in Unit 1. And we uh, basically had packaged it up in 2002. And this was a 770 ton package um, that we shipped um, off to uh, Clive, Utah, where a lot of the other material was going to go. This was considered a low level waste shipment. Um, so on the, on the night of May 24th, the shipment left by rail, uh, traveling from San Onofre to Apex, Nevada, where it was then uh, put on a uh, uh, truck and then shipped the rest of the way to Clive, Utah. So you can kind of see those red cars on either side of the package. That's a, uh, uh, what's called a schnabel car. It's the, it was the largest in the world, actually, to be able to accommodate this 770 ton um, package. And we coordinated this move with about 20 other organizations uh, to make it happen successfully. And so um, we were able to ship that off site. We won't have many more, uh, I don't think we'll have any of these 770 ton shipments at all. This one was a, uh, was a unique project. So what happens when uh, all of this stuff is removed from the site? Well, uh, there are some things that are going to remain uh, after decommissioning. Uh, we will have the, uh, the switch yard, uh, which if you drive on Interstate 5, you'll pass underneath the, uh, the electric wires. Uh, that switch yard is a uh, vital piece of infrastructure that connects uh, SCE's grid to San Diego Gas and Electric's grid, so uh, that will remain. Um, the dry fuel storage area will remain. Um, also, because it is um, until we get a place to move the fuel to, we will be storing that safely on site. And then the final structure that will uh, remain is the seawall, the walkway, and the riprap that uh, exists uh, below the walkway. And so those are the areas that will uh, continue uh, to, to exist on site. Once we get the uh, dry fuel off site, uh, then certainly uh, some of these other structures in the final decommissioning, some of the below grade uh, structures uh, will be addressed. Um, and then, uh, but those are sort of gives you an idea of, uh, of how the site might look and, uh, and what's going to remain. There's also some structures offshore and we'll be uh, uh, taking care of these as well. Um, these are uh, conduits that were used uh, for cooling the plant when it was operating, and obviously uh, we no longer need these. So some of them extend offshore uh, as far as 8,000 feet. Um, they are uh, located, uh, the conduits, about five feet below uh, the uh, seafloor. And then uh, they have diffusers and intake structures that rise up above the seafloor. And so we will be removing uh, the intake structures and some of the diffusers, and then we'll, um, uh, in 2035, the, the uh, State Lands Commission will make a final determination on how uh, they want this to be um, uh, dispositioned. The, uh, the conduits have been there for, you know, obviously over 40 years, and there's a lot of uh, marine and sea life that has uh, grown up around them. So by removing some of the diffuser ports, we'll allow some sand to fill in the conduits and then we'll, uh, we'll take a look. But uh, removing the conduits might disturb a lot of, uh, a lot of marine life, so we'll have to take a, uh, take a look at that. So this is kind of a view from the, the beach uh, to the south of the plant looking north, and uh, probably about 2027, this uh, will probably be the view uh, that you'll see as we have uh, removed the uh, containment domes and. Uh, a lot of the structures that are uh, adjacent to the sea, the turbine building and, and those types of things. So the way they're going to remove the uh, containment domes is kind of interesting. What they do is they go around the bottom and, and weaken it and then the domes will uh, collapse down and then they'll remove all that material, weaken it again in, in six to eight foot sections and keep bringing it down. 
uh, slowly in that manner. And so uh, those containment domes are, uh, you know, thick four foot thick concrete with uh, steel rebar inside, uh, heavily reinforced. So um, that uh, basically the the work on the containment domes, both inside and uh, and to bring them down, are sort of the uh, uh, the uh, uh, the long pole in the tent in terms of this project. Those are the one the things that are uh, are why this is taking till 2029. So here's a look at our next steps, um, basically from. Uh, uh, the first uh, first years from going back to uh, last year, uh, looking forward, uh, we've completed some actions already. Um, we will be completing the fuel transfer from wet to dry storage this week. So we have loaded up our, our last spent fuel canister and uh, we'll be prepared to, uh, uh, to store that uh, later this week. And that will have removed all the spent fuel from both spent fuel pools. And then we'll, you'll see some of the other items that we still have to uh, do coming up in the next few years. And then going out to years six to 10, um, you know, when we really get into a lot of the major building demolition, um, we're gonna be removing uh, structures down to three feet below grade, then backfilling and grading the site. Uh, and I, as I mentioned, the um, dry fuel storage area, the switch yard shoreline protection features will remain behind. And, uh, and then after the fuel is transferred off site, then we do um, the final site restoration uh, after conversations with the Navy and the, uh, and the Coastal Commission on what that will look like. In terms of spent fuel management, um, as I said, uh, we're wrapping up our movement of, uh, of spent fuel to dry storage. Um, a lot of people aren't quite sure what spent nuclear fuel is. And so uh, I just wanted to talk briefly about this. Basically, it's a, it's a small ceramic pellet. And those pellets are what go into the reactor uh, in fuel rods that are contained in, in fuel assemblies. And when they go into the reactor, they're 95% uranium-238 and 5% uranium-235. After producing a lot of carbon-free electricity for a number of years, when we take them out of the reactor, they've undergone a little bit of a change. So that 5% of uh, uranium-235 is now 1% uranium-235, and then there's 1% of plutonium and 3% of other uh, fission products that are in the fuel. And basically, uh, those are all locked in that ceramic pellet that we then store in our spent fuel canisters. This is what a fuel assembly looks like. So if you're uh, looking at um, that, uh, that is actually the last fuel assembly from the unit three spent fuel pool that is being stored in a canister that you can see at the bottom of the picture. So um, once we get all the fuel assemblies in those uh, canisters, they're drained, they're dried, they're backfilled with helium, which is an inert gas, and then, uh, the, they're welded and, uh, and then uh, that weld seals, uh, seals them up and then they are placed in the dry fuel storage system. So we'll have 73 canisters in our Holtec system. We already have 50 canisters in our uh, transnuclear, uh, what we call the new home system uh, on site. So 123 total. This is what those systems look like. Um, you can see the Holtec and, uh, and, and the Areva system, um, which is a uh, horizontal, uh, the Holtec system is a vertical storage system. Um, but that's on the side of the old uh, unit one reactor. And so uh, that is the site that, uh, that will remain. Uh, the fuel uh, that is stored there are, is uh, extremely, it's an extremely robust and safe system. Um, it actually has more than twice the seismic rating as the plants uh, themselves. So um, it uh, can guard against uh, earthquakes, tsunami, um, any kind of natural phenomenon, um, a very robust system. And uh, there's more than 3,000 uh, spent nuclear fuel canisters uh, stored in the United States. There's never been a... Um, uh, incident with spent fuel that has harmed either people or the environment. It's, uh, it's very safe. The, 
the fuel itself basically is just undergoing radioactive decay. It just, uh, it just sits there um, and, uh, and basically gets less radioactive over time. And, uh, and the, the systems themselves have no moving parts. It's all convection cooling. And, uh, and so it requires no electricity, no pumps. Uh, so in that regard, uh, it's certainly uh, safer to a degree than uh, storing the fuel in a spent fuel pool, which is very safe. Uh, but uh, we believe these are, uh, this storage system is even safer. So we have uh, 72 of 73 canisters stored. The last one, again, will be, uh, will be stored this week and then we'll be done with fuel transfer operations. And, and really at that point, um, you know, the focus becomes trying to move um, the fuel offsite. And we're developing a strategic plan uh, that will help guide us and prepare us for that eventuality. Um, if you had a chance to see the uh, Union Tribune this morning, our chief nuclear officer had a op-ed in there talking about how we're going to safely store the fuel on site until we can uh, have a chance to move it off site. So um, I would encourage everyone to take a look at that because that really is the ultimate goal. Southern California Edison does not want to keep the fuel at songs any longer than it needs to. So we're going to be working to see if we can get this fuel uh, to another location. In terms of getting the fuel ready for transportation, more than 80% more than of the fuel is ready to be transported now if we had someplace to uh, transport it to. So you can kind of see the timeline as uh, how over the next decade, uh, basically all the fuel will be ready to be transported. And this is to meet uh, Department of Transportation guidelines. So um, we're, uh, we're close. Uh, any transportation effort will happen over a uh, long term. I don't want to make it seem like this is uh, something that will be done uh, uh, quickly. Um, this will be something that will happen over, over a decade or more in terms of trying to, uh, uh, to get the fuel off site. So again, our decommissioning principles, safety, stewardship, and engagement. Um, the, those are the principles that guide us uh, as we go through our decommissioning. And, uh, and certainly as part of the engagement, um, we have a community engagement panel um, that has been uh, meeting for six years. And uh, we hold quarterly meetings. Uh, currently, they're available via Skype. But I would encourage you all to uh, join us for our August 20th meeting. Um, these meetings have a lot of information on what is happening at Songs, sort of the important issues um, that, uh, that not only uh, affect us, but, uh, but you know, to try and get the, uh, try and get the fuel off site. So uh, a lot of good information there and uh, I would encourage you to join us if you can. So, so at this point, I'll take any, uh, any questions. Um, Any questions for our speaker, John Dobkin, today? Maybe we could stop sharing the screen so that we could see the, there we go. So we could see the little faces on the screen. Okay. Anybody have a question? Want to unmute? All right. Well, thank you, John, for an excellent, oh, wait, Haney, do you have a question? I do. Thank you. Uh, John, this is, that was an interesting and great presentation. I reflect on my old days as a nuclear power operator in the United States Navy Submarine Force. Um, and, uh, but I wanted to ask the, the, and forgive me if I missed this, but who covers the cost of decommissioning? You said it's a, it's a near, I think it went all the way to 2050 ish, right? Is that, is that the investors of SCE or, or where, where, do, where are those costs born? Um, that was uh, from the decommissioning fund that we built up over time. So again, beginning in 1988, uh, we started collecting a small amount of money from customers for basically each kilowatt of electricity that, uh, that came from uh, San Onofre and put that into a fund, built that up to the $4.4 billion amount that, uh, that we have now um, that we are then using for decommissioning. And that's something that all nuclear plants do. Um, and, and as I said, some of them, some of them do it better than others. Some require a little bit uh, more time after uh, 
retiring the plants in order to build up the fund. Uh, but we had uh, enough uh, money at that point when we retired the plants to launch into decommissioning. So that's what we did. Great, thank you. Any other questions? Any hands up, anybody? Okay, great. Thank you, John, for being with us today and for sharing that important information. And we hope that we can stay engaged with you and continue to have updates. So thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. Appreciate it. Uh, we'll move on to our next speakers. Uh, we're going to be talking about Prop 15, which will be on the ballot in November. And we have two speakers. We discussed how we would have this presentation. We wanted to make sure that we were being equitable and that we had speakers from both sides. So uh, we will start with Ben Grief. I know on the agenda it said somebody else's name, but Ben, ben is our speaker today for the yes side, and then we'll move on to the no side. So we'll, we'll go ahead and pass the baton to Ben. Great, thank you very much, Teresa. Um, thanks so much uh, for having me. Um, normally we have about five minutes for these, um, so I, I certainly won't be taking up all of my time, um, but certainly happy to uh, participate in question and answer afterwards. Um, I will just work to share my screen here. Great, and just a thumbs up if you could see the screen. I think I can see your whole desktop. Oh, so. perfect, excellent, good, good, good. Just wanna make sure, perfect. Um, there we go. Oops. Oops. Let me go back here. Go back to slide one. Okay, excellent. So um, again, my name is Ben Grief. I'm here on behalf of the Schools and Communities First campaign, um, or Prop 15, as it's now known. Um, I want to sort of run over some things about this initiative, um, you know, what it specifically does. Um, but I, I think the, the most important thing for you know, everyone to know um, is that this is something that does not change anything for residential properties at all. So any homes, any apartment buildings of any size, you know, any you know, at-home businesses, um, if we're talking about you know, senior centers, if we're talking about mobile homes, this initiative does not do anything to change any um, property taxes for any residential property. So I always like to make that clear right at the beginning. Um, uh, there we go. So really just to set the scene here, you know, in 1977, uh, before Prop 13 passed, California was ranked number seven in the nation in per student funding. And, and today, unfortunately, we're, we're down to number 39. Um, we're last in the nation in number of students per teacher and ratio of students per counselor, as well as librarian. Um, and you know, it's not just our schools, but the decline in local government revenue um, has, has really been apparent. You know, it fell from $790 um, per person to $640 today. Um, and our infrastructure spending is also lagging. You know, we're now 39th in capital spending in, in all 50 states in California. So this is sort of where we are now and why, you know, from our point of view, we need to, to make a change. Um, but in terms of, you know, business interests, you know, this is the type of situation that we have here that really just doesn't make any sense um, where you see two properties, you know, these are examples, you know, there's one example here, but we see this, you know, time and again, all across California, you know, very similar properties, very close. These are a half mile apart. So there should be no reason why they should be paying vastly different property taxes. You know, this is a situation where, you know, the Burbank studios are now at a competitive disadvantage to their neighbors, Disney's down the street because they're having to pay more property taxes um, simply because they purchased their property um, at a later date than uh, Walt Disney did. And this is the type of situation that just doesn't make any sense and, and a situation you wouldn't find anywhere else. Um, it, it's really the opposite of fostering new business and fostering entrepreneurship by giving a really leg up to commercial property owners simply because they've owned their property um, years before their competitor nearby. Um, so the basics of our initiative are that it reclaims up to $12 billion a year for our schools and local communities. Um, and we're really focusing on these undervalued non-residential commercial industrial properties um, that will be simply reassessed 
at fair market value, um, which is the system that they have pretty much everywhere else in America. Um, our initiative applies to larger non-residential commercial industrial properties, like I mentioned before, you know, homeowners, you know, apartment owners will be exempt, but also agricultural land is, is going to be protected as well. Um, and, you know, really the, the important thing to know is also that properties valued under $3 million uh, will be exempt. Um, so this will only reassess properties that are valued at $3 million or more. Um, and also, this initiative maintains um, the 1% commercial property tax rate in California. So it does not change the tax rate. Um, the rate will remain at 1%, uh, which is one of the lowest rates in the nation. Um, this will be phased in starting in 2022, um, and properties will be reassessed um, every year, or excuse me, um, every three years after that. Um, and really this will broaden the property tax base. It will increase revenues, which will mean underlying debt of schools, counties and cities and special districts can also be paid off sooner. So there are a lot of underlying benefits to this as well, aside from just you know, raising revenue that um, our schools and communities need. Um, specifically, 60% of this money will go to fund our cities and counties and special districts like our fire districts and you know, our water districts. 40% um, of the money will go to fund public education, 11% um, to community colleges and 89% to um, K through 12 schools. Um, you know, it's really important to note that property tax money is local money. Um, so this is money that um, will go to these you know local cities or local counties this is not money that will you know go up to sacramento and you know, it's some black hole somewhere you know we have revenue and estimates for how much each county and how much each city um, stands to gain um, from this you know finally just to wrap up in terms of benefits to business again this is regular reassessment at fair market value you know, nothing more, nothing less, just a system that they have everywhere else in the country. It will maintain our really low 1% property tax rate, you know, as a comparison, you know, other cities across the country have, you know, 2% property tax rate for commercial property, 3%, you know, 4% sometimes, but this will maintain our 1% rate. Um, also, you know, this initiative provides one of the largest tax breaks in a generation for businesses. Uh, we're going to uh, eliminate the business purple personal property tax for up to the first half million dollars on equipment and fixtures. Um, this is a perfect example of a tax that um, California would have to make up for the lost revenue from not getting, you know, stable property tax money. Uh, we want to eliminate that um, right off the bat. And, you know, the, the final thing that I'll conclude with here, is that you know this really isn't a tax on all businesses or a tax on all property owners you know in in the way that um, other folks might paint it as um, you know the, the reality is that you know most commercial properties in California are paying at or near market value already um, there's really only a small minority of commercial property owners that are still paying property taxes based on 30 or 40 year old uh, property values right there's so much new development so many properties that have changed hands over the last 42 years. Um, and so the, you know, the, the Walt Disney's of the world, you know, who are still paying, you know, 1970s property taxes are, you know, fewer and farther between. And so that's why 92% of the revenue is going to come from just 10% of commercial properties in California. Um, so, you know, this is just wanted to lay out, you know, sort of all the, the basics and all the facts of this initiative. And I'm certainly happy to take any questions um, from folks um, uh, when that time arises. Thank you all very much. Thank you very much, Ben. And I think we're going to move straight into the no side and then we'll do the question and answer so that we can direct them to, to both of you. So I will uh, invite Haney Hong to present on the no side. Thank you. Well, good morning, folks. And uh, first, uh, let me say it's uh, nice to be invited back. Uh, so I spoke with you all, I can't remember when, but that I've been invited back means I didn't totally screw up the first time. So uh, you guys are a great group. Um, and the thing I appreciated and I recall from our first conversation was that 
uh, all of you want to get uh, less into the politics and really want to roll up the sleeves and understand uh, the devil, the, 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 the devil in the details. And so recall that when I was here last, uh, we were talking about CCAs, remember? Uh, we were talking about that, and I got on the whiteboard with everybody, and we drew some macroeconomic charts, and uh, we discussed we discussed those economics, and uh, and it's unfortunate that the first CCA in the region, uh, which promised lower rates and greener energy, turns out that it's still unclear if it's greener, and it turns out it's not cheaper. And uh, you can look at recent Union Tribune reporting on that. And again, the devil's in the details here. Um, I'm not here to hustle for the no campaign. I'm just here to do, which is the same thing that I did uh, with you all last time, is just lay out information, especially on the details, likely impacts to help you consider the measure. Uh, you all know that we have a reputation at the San Diego County Taxpayers Association. We, we're, we're number nerds. We're analytical. We're driven by the numbers. And uh, by the way, uh, sorry, I hope this is okay with the, the, the Carlsbad Chamber folks, you know, public service announcement. Uh, I know many of you are in your business roles here, but uh, if uh, any of you or your households would love to join the Taxpayers Association as individuals, we would welcome it. We're especially looking for frustrated parents to help us understand what's going on in the schools so we can figure out how we can get to efficiency and education and uh, uh, efficiency and effectiveness in education. But I'm going to start big picture uh, and drill down to where we are today, if that's all right. So first, uh, let me share an interesting factoid. Um, in the late 1970s, the San Diego County Taxpayers Association, we opposed Proposition 13. Okay, let me, let, me, let me say that. We opposed Proposition 13. Let that settle in for a second. Most folks don't know that. Most folks expect, think that we, we might have opposed that. We made the argument back then that Proposition 13 would just make a complete mess of public finance in California, okay? And uh, I think it turns out that the Taxpayers Association, kind of like our discussion on CCAs, uh, we ended up being right, uh, because if you look at your property tax bill, it's very unclear, it's hard to understand what we're paying for and what we're getting out of it, right? You get your property tax bill, it's got a thousand things. Uh, about two years ago, I had, a journalist was talking with me about property taxes. I printed my property tax bill so I could explain to her how this kind of works, okay? It's complicated. Now, Prop 13 passed. I wasn't around back then, uh, and even if I was, I wouldn't have spoken English because English was not my first language, so I wouldn't have understood it. Uh, but here we are, and uh, because of Prop 13, we, the, the mess that we've made of public finance, there's no one mining the whole coop. So if you look and think about each of our lives here, you, have a, you might have a, uh, a water district, a school district, a fire district, uh, this and that, and they each charge their own taxes, okay? And there's no one looking at the entire balance sheet and the entire, I'll call it, P&L for the region, okay? No one's mining the whole coop. So as, as, as we continue through the next couple generations, right, one at a time, right, each of these agencies, because they're trying to achieve a, a need uh, caused by Prop 13, right, limitations, they're asking for a tax, they're asking for a tax, they're asking for a tax. And there are no constraints because each agency is just focusing on what it does. Like one agency that's focused on fire doesn't care what's going on in water. and doesn't care what's going on in education. Okay. And so there's no pressures to keep costs under control. And over the past, uh, I mean, over the past two generations, we've added a number of costs and we'll go into that. And interestingly enough, you know, uh, uh, now is, a uh, we, you know, we're, we're, a, we're a progressive state, but, we have the highest tax burden at the same time we have the highest poverty rate on a purchase power parity basis and the highest homelessness rate. So what we're trying to achieve, we're not, we're not achieving it. We need to get the costs under control and we need to keep our tax base healthy and tax increases, <laughs> excuse me, from a macroeconomic view. I mean, I kind of think of it like a, it's, it's like, it's just like a system. It's like a balloon, you know, when you put, when you poke, when you push the balloon, in one spot, something pops out somewhere else, and that's what happens. And so when it comes to the split role and Prop 13, um, the negative overall effect, I mean, I think the key thing that folks need to understand is that commercial landlords, I mean, many of you, uh, many of you who uh, as, as uh, business owners and, and, and small businesses in the community, uh, I think you'll understand that 
commercial landlords will simply pass all of these costs mm -hmm. to their tenants mm -hmm. and to you, okay? Small businesses and large. Okay, and what does that mean for you, right? I mean, that ultimately means higher rental rates. It means that we're gonna, you're gonna have reduced uh, capital to invest in your own growth, right? Likely to have fewer job opportunities available. You might have to consider not increasing wages for folks. You might have to inc uh, increase prices. Um, and, you know, from a public standpoint, there's going to be a decline in the value of the financial assets held by public retirement funds. Big hey, picture. Ask, uh -huh. Do you have a PowerPoint that you're trying to share with us? No, I okay. don't. I don't, I, I don't like PowerPoint because I don't know about you guys, but when I said, I mean, I'm, Maybe it's because of my Navy background. I see PowerPoint and immediately I start falling asleep. <laughs> Maybe it's, this is my Navy background. So I don't like doing PowerPoint. I just wanted to um, make sure we weren't missing it. Okay, I'll go back on Yeah, here. Yeah. I wish I had a whiteboard though. Remember last time I, I did a whiteboard, I would have done it with a whiteboard. Um, and so, right, this, it's a balloon. You poke it here and, it, and it, 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 it goes through the system and it's gonna go through the system for everybody here. And ultimately, at the end of the day, we aren't, we aren't keeping negative pressures on our costs and the cost of doing the public work. And people will say, and just like you've heard, um, that it's about the schools. And the truth of the matter is that when it comes to the schools, there is already a lot of money going to the schools. Uh, in 2020, uh, the 2020-2021 the school year is going to be $70 billion plus $11 billion in deferred payments maintains the, the minimum requirement of 81 billion. Um, at the end of the day, our problems in trying to get, uh, and I'm not even sure that I would call it problems, getting revenue for public good is not, uh, it's not a problem of how much money, it's a problem of how we spend the money. And how do we get what it is that we're looking for? Like I said earlier, because of Prop 13, and the incremental tax increases, there's no pressure to keep costs contained, right? All of you as business owners, you, you naturally have to keep costs contained because you don't know necessarily what your revenue is and you don't know what your sales are gonna be, right? Like if you knew your sales were gonna grow forever and you could just constantly lob on and require more people to, to pay you money, right? Then, then you wouldn't have as many constraints to keep your costs under control. Um, one thing to point out, especially in education, most school districts, um, it's uh, on average 85 to even ni sometimes 95% are just on uh, 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 personnel and personnel related expenses. Um, in the Los Angeles uh, Unified School District, uh, something to note, um, employees and their dependents, they don't pay any healthcare premium, they don't have any deductibles and they have lifetime benefits. Um, and the, the district itself estimates that in two years, their health and pension payments are going to be 37% of its general fund budget, 37%, more than a third. And, and right now, I mean, they have an unfunded liability of retiree health benefits of 15 billion. So we've got to get these costs under control. These costs are unsustainable and we need to curb these costs before, again, act, asking for more taxes that simply pass through to all of the businesses and consumers, right? I mean, it's gonna increase rents. Uh, you're going to have whatever, whatever these increased uh, uh, payments to California will be, will ultimately end up resulting in higher prices for you at the supermarket, higher rent, uh, uh, you know, in terms of office buildings, et cetera, et cetera. And, you know, I can, I could go on uh, I could go on and on, but I think that uh, I think that trying to keep it under like five to ten minutes here. I mean, big picture is what we need to do in California is we have to really get our costs under control, and um, and unfortunately, Prop 13 has created this incentive where we just kind of let costs run away. And uh, what this will do, it will simply be more money that goes in this direction, costs that will be borne by all of us. And we're not going to actually get any more efficiency or effectiveness out of our um, out of our government, and uh, and so for that reason, that's why uh, the Taxpayers Association recommends that all of you think uh, vote no on Prop 15. Thank you. Thank you very much.
Uh, we are now in the period for Q&A and uh, we'll have an opportunity for people to raise their hands, but at first I want to call out the question that's in the chat box. Uh, is there going to be, this is from Jim Harper, is there going to be any impact on community facilities districts or other infrastructure financing mechanisms? Um, I'm unsure about that. Um, I don't know if, if, if someone might want to elaborate a little bit more. Uh, Jim, do you want to add on to your question? Jim Harper, there you are. Uh, not, much, not much to add there. Just uh, CFDs, Mellow Roos. I was just wondering if there's anything buried in the, uh, the usual fine print about uh, them being affected at all. You know, the, you know, the interesting thing is there's a lot to, to sort of talk about in, in, in this initiative, but in terms of the fine print, it's, it's, it's pretty simple. You know, we're just going to establish regular reassessment of non-residential commercial properties um, over $3 million. Um, and so that's, uh, that, you know, with obviously exemptions for, you know, non-resident or for residential commercial property and residential property and agriculture. Um, so that's all I could say about that. Thank you, Haney. Are you aware of anything uh, in that might affect CFDs? I mean, ultimately, the way that the state decides to distribute certain funds could ultimately get affected. I think that this um, ultimately is just changing how it is that commercial properties are reassessed. And so that that will then in aggregate, because that contributes to the property tax kitties that for instance, um, or the, the, the assessments against which, you know, like any financing for a special finance, uh, like a special, uh, like any special district that has already levied a property tax uh, for something, it will also increase the valuation and then that burden, if that, if that makes sense. I hope I articulate my thought clearly. Thank you. Makes sense. Thank you. Uh, there's another question here from Chuck Bretz. Uh, given the problems, Haney, that you outline, it sounds as if you support the repeal of Prop 13. Is that true? Interesting question. I think if, uh, if you had asked uh, the San Diego County Taxpayers Association maybe in 1978, the year after, uh, I think folks probably would have said, let's, let's repeal Prop 13. I think that given that we're 40 years, uh, you know, 43 years later, um, because of all the other tax liabilities that have been created in the meantime, I think that, I mean, this is me, I would be very reticent to repeal Prop 13 without addressing the other tax liabilities that we've created in California. Great, thank you. Uh, there's another question here. Uh, Brett, yes. Uh, excuse me, Ben, a question for you. You mentioned that, um, if this were to pass, that it would uh, repeal uh, or it would create uh, some kind of tax break uh, for up to $500,000 for businesses. I think it was for like capital improvements. But kind of going off what Haney said, going forward, would all the special districts um, still have the ability to, to propose like infrastructure bonds, like a school district or, or you know, the, the college, community college districts and the hospital districts that all, many of them currently have one in place, but, and I'm sure those wouldn't change, but would they still be able to come to us voters in the future and propose another one if this were to pass? Um, yeah, that's a good question. Just to be uh, more specific, this is the um, an exemption for the first five hundred thousand dollars in uh, personal uh, business property. So you know, in a restaurant, you know, that's your tables, chairs, forks, knives, pots, pans, ovens, refrigerators, all of that. Right now, you have to count that all up every year, depreciate it, and then pay a tax on that. We would eliminate that tax for the first half a million dollars. Um, because again, it's just an, an example of how over the last 40 years, our local governments or local schools um, have lost about $150 billion from the fact that we don't have regular reassessment of non-residential commercial property like they do everywhere else in the country. And so we've had to nickel and dime your individual and your small business owner. Um, and 
you know, this is, it, this is very narrow in its focus. So, you know, I can't say, so, so it doesn't say that, uh, you know, the, a special district um, in your county can't put a bond or a parcel tax on the ballot. Um, but really, you know, parcel taxes are something that we have here in California because of Prop 13. Um, and, you know, that they, there's something that does, don't exist in Texas, you know, because Texas regularly reassesses its commercial property. Um, and so they don't have to have all these other things that we have here. Um, and so my hope is that there's less of a need for, you know, special districts and local communities to say, hey, we need you all to pay another $100 per parcel to fund our parks or to fund our libraries, right? That, that's not a good way to do things. That's something that um, certainly was not part of the original plan when Prop 13 passed, was, was to you know, have all these other uh, you know, Band-Aid solutions and temporary fixes. Um, and I, I believe that, that was an unintended consequence of, of this initiative. And so if we can just have reliable, stable revenue coming in, then there's less of a need to nickel and dime everyone else. Thank you. There are a number of other questions here. Teresa, can I make a can I make an additional comment <clears throat> based on the, the the gentleman's question? Is that um, <clears throat> I mean I think that this is the argument that I was trying to make is that we're going to have if this were to pass, it for instance doesn't preclude any special district or any school district from then continuing to levy other property taxes. I think the main issue again is that we have to get costs under control and and we got to keep in mind too with the shrinking tax base <clears throat> that or we can incentivize the continued shrinking of the tax base i think that there is a there is a there is a point where public investment in the public investment money put through taxes will displace private sector investment in the economy and again no one's looking at the big picture um, and because everybody and the state and each agency is just incentivized to look at their own PNL or their own statement of activities, they don't have a PNL, right? But their own statement of activities and balance sheet, they're just going to levy tax increases for what they need to do. And there's nothing that's containing all of that. Thank you, Teresa. Thank you. What is the phase in mechanism proposed? How is that tiered uh, for the different business properties? Um, so, you know, like I mentioned before, you know, 92% of this revenue is going to come from just 10% of commercial properties. Those are some of the oldest and largest properties that haven't been reassessed, um, you know, sometimes ever um, since 1978. And so those will be the properties that the assessors will be looking at first, um, because, you know, honestly, the assessors don't have the capacity to just snap their fingers and in 2022 reassess all commercial property in California. That's, that's a, a huge workload. For them and so by focusing on the small number of properties first um, that is a way for them to be able to do their work and for the this money to come into our schools and local communities fastest and then after that they can focus on some of the smaller properties um, the properties that you know are paying you know near market value now um, more specifically in the measure any uh, commercial property over three million dollars that has 50% um, tenants or more that are small businesses, those you know, won't be touched until 2025, 2026 at the earliest. Haney, did you want to make any comment? Yeah, I think that, um, you know, I, I wanna make a comment about one piece here where we're talking about some sort of disparity or we're calling it something unfair, you know, the example of the Walt Disney Studios versus Burbank Studios, which are half a mile apart. Um, the truth is you could probably make that argument about also any residential neighborhood. Um, so if you were to be in Coronado um, or well, here, sorry, let's not, Let's, let's not refer to a other city in the region whose name starts with C. Let's talk about Carlsbad, right? There are probably some people here in Carlsbad who happened to purchase their home in the, in, the, in the 70s or 80s. And their property tax basis right now is very low compared to what uh, somebody half a mile down the block who just bought yesterday is going to pay. So that disparity, that, 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 that disparity also exists 
in residential. So if that is the argument, uh, if that is the argument for why it is that then you tackle commercial, I don't understand what stops then the next argument to stop that disparity on the residential side. Just a, just a thought there. So Teresa, I'd love to, to respond to that. Um, I think the first thing I'll say that is, is that nobody would ever want to change the residential side of, of Prop 13. Um, I've been working on this issue and in this space for the last seven years all around the state and there's no organization that has ever talked about that or, or would think about doing that. Um, and I wasn't here, you know, maybe some folks on the call were, were um, in 1978, but my understanding is that this initiative was meant to protect people and was meant to protect homes and keep people in their homes. And this was not a movement that was meant to say, well, you know, Disneyland, you're gonna have property taxes at 1975 rates for the end of time. That, that certainly was not what this is for. Um, so I just wanna make it clear that, you know, no one is talking about changing anything for residential properties. If there was some organization that did wanna do that and they were able to raise tens of millions of dollars to run a statewide ballot measure campaign, they would still have to then convince voters, many of whom are homeowners, to take those protections away from themselves. So the idea that that would ever happen is preposterous. But I would also say that Prop 13 was supposed to keep all of our taxes down, but what it's actually done is it's shifted the tax burden onto homeowners and individuals. You know, in 1978, roughly 55% of the property taxes in California were coming from residential properties, 45% were coming from commercial properties. Today, 72% of our property taxes in California are coming from residential properties and only 28% are coming from commercial properties. So we have to take a look at this and say like, why? Why is this the case? Well, there's a regular reassessment mechanism already in place for homes. So while you know, one homeowner who just bought their home might be paying a lot more in property taxes than their neighbor down the street, um, that neighbor down the street will move at some point. That neighbor down the street will pass away at some point. That home will change hands and reassessment will happen. But when we're talking about Disney, you know, who here thinks that they're going to move their theme park ever? Who here thinks that they're going to sell uh, their theme park? You know, it's just, just obviously not going to happen. And so this specific loophole in the law that again when it passed in 1978 people were not aware of and were not going out and voting for this they were voting for their homes to keep them in their homes is something that um, really only helps out these you know large you know legacy commercial property owners so it, it's really something that you know has nothing to do with sort of the potential unfairness of residential property taxes being paid Prop 13 was for us, it was to keep our property taxes down. It will remain in place probably forever um, because we're already paying so many other taxes in every other way. Why would anyone want to get rid of that? So it's something that I firmly support. Um, and you know, I, I know everyone else in our coalition um, does as well. Thank you, Ben. Uh, we have a, a number of questions left and I want to zoom through them so that we can uh, move through our agenda, but I don't want to exclude anybody. So let's, um, Let's ask these next ones. Uh, this relates to those, those $3 million, that limit. This one says many families own their homes through a family trust or an LLC, especially if their home is worth more than $3 million. Are you saying that if they own their home through an, L, an LLC, which is a business, the residential property worth over $3 million will be excluded from this formula? Yes. Any, any residential property, anywhere where people live, will completely be excluded from any reassessment. Great question. Commercial properties only, okay. And who would have the authority to change the $3 million limit over time? The taxpayers, the governor, the legislature? I, mean, I, I should have been more clear about this earlier, so I'm glad someone asked this. Um, this is something that will, will, will go up um, with inflation. So the, the 3 million will continue to rise because obviously one day all properties will be uh, you know, more than 3 million and so that, that will continue to go up with inflation. So it has a built-in escalator tied to inflation. Got it. Uh, Shirley Anderson worked for a California congressman during the time that Prop 13 was passed and would like to make a comment. 
Do you have a question as well? Um, yeah, I just, um, uh, to, uh, to reinforce what Haney had said regarding um, the issues of what happened back then, this really was about uh, the property taxes in California at that time that were just going out of control and we wanted to make sure or save grandma's house, grandpa's house. Um, I sat in on meetings with the California Bankers Association and I was one of those young staff members in the back of the room taking notes. And the conversations were when they figure out the loopholes, when they figure out, when the lawyers figure out what they can do to change the loopholes, this is not going 40 years from now, we're now realizing that the experiment that we were all invested in at the time has created a real diversity among taxpayers. And specifically, uh, this whole issue about um, homes and trust, my own family, I have an aunt who had a, an amazing house that passed on to her daughter, who's now passed on to her grandson. The grandson has the house and he pays the same tax basis that my aunt paid years ago. So that sort of disparity was never intended by this law. And we now have, we now learn that we had to create things like Melarus. Riverside County is doing a very unique thing with their tax basis for homeowners. And that is they created this one to four tier. New construction is a four, they pay a much bigger tax portion. If you buy a home in Riverside that's over 20 years old, you're gonna have a proportionately lower tax basis. And it creates, uh, I, have, I had a niece who wanted to buy a new home, new construction, she couldn't afford it. She wanted to pay $450,000 for a home, she couldn't get a new one. She had to buy a 40 year old home so she could afford that home and qualify for the loan. So there's just, there's so many moving parts to this and I guess my final comment on this is, this is a very important legislation that will bring the money back to the schools and the communities where it belongs, and we won't have to float all these bonds all the time. I'm at a point now where I pay huge property tax on my home. I've lived here for 10 years. I pay a ridiculous amount of property taxes, and every time I voted for the fire station. I voted for that increase to my taxes for that fire station. I regret it now. For one, it's still not built all these years later. And two, that is something that would have benefited from this change and this law. And um, as, as far as the Disneyland, that everybody knows that that is, um, there are people who actually live in Anaheim who pay homeowners who pay more property taxes than Disneyland pays for their property taxes. That's held in a family trust. It's, it's something that's talked about all the time. And, and I just, um, I'm also a part of the League of Women Voters. I mean, they have um, been talking about this issue a lot and it's time, it's time for reform. It's time to get the money back into our schools and our communities. And it's, this is a start. That's my comment. Thank you, Shirley. Uh, uh, any response from Haney or Ben? I think we have one last question after that. Uh, the question relates to the passing down of property. My understanding is that some exclusions from reassessment will be negatively impacted, such as the reassessment exclusion for passing a primary resident between parent and child will be limited. And currently, right now, it's not limited. Any comment on that? Um, so there is an, a propos proposition 19 that will be on the ballot in November discusses this. Um, our proposition is, is totally different, so I don't want to comment on another proposition. Um, but I will, you know, thank um, the woman for her comments. And I, I, I do just want to, you know, end by saying a, a couple of quick things. Um, number one, I understand that this is in a space that's going to be really excited about the idea of this initiative. So I, I appreciate you all um, taking the time to, to listen today. Um, but, but I also think it, it's an important moment in, in California. We really have to think about sort of what, where we are moving forward. And, you know, the fact that we spend, you know, $10,000 less per student than New York on our schools when we used to be tied for fifth with New York in the 1970s prior to uh, Prop 13 passing is something we really need to take a look at. 
Um, I think the idea that the opposition is going to be saying that this is going to increase the cost of goods and services is completely false. Um, obviously, Disneyland is still not paying, is still not charging 1970s ticket prices. Chevron, who's saving $100 million statewide, is not charging 1970s prices for gas. And all the different grocery stores out there that are in different locations all across the state paying different prices for leases or owning their property outright, you know, the price of milk is the same at every Trader Joe's that you go to. Price of milk is the same at every Whole Foods. It, the prices of goods and services are in no way related to the property taxes being paid. The other thing is that much of this savings is not going to Californians. It's going to folks in New York. It's going to people that own property in California that are based in Florida. It's going to folks in Hong Kong. So this is not money that's coming out of our communities if we change this. This is money that's coming into our communities from out of state and out of country um, investors. And just finally to wrap up, this is not some left-wing Berkeley idea. What we're advocating for might seem like a kind of a big change in California, but it would just establish the same taxing system that they have in Oklahoma, Mississippi, or Alabama. It's just common sense. And if we don't do this, we're gonna be seeing more parcel taxes, more bond measures. Folks in the legislature are already talking about another um, increase in the income tax. It's already the highest tax in the country in terms of income. We need not those solutions. We need common sense solutions to put us on par with the rest of the country. So thank you all very much. Thank you, Ben. And Haney, would you like to respond and add your closing comments as well? Sure. Uh, first, again, great to be with all of you. Uh, it's a fun group. Sorry, we couldn't do this in person. COVID kind of stinks for a lot of folks. Uh, but I uh, appreciate the chance to talk about it. I think that, uh, again, all, at the end of the day, I think that it is, it is very dangerous to think that somehow a change in how the public brings in cash has no impact on the economy. I think that's a very dangerous thing to ever believe um, because you all as business owners know that that costs pass through. Um, and I think that at the end of the day, right, I, you know, the, the, the gentleman suggested, Ben suggested that we're at a moment in California's history. And I would agree, we're at a moment in California's history. Highest tax rate, highest poverty rate, highest homelessness rate. So what we have to do is get costs under control. We don't need to put more, necessarily put more money into the kitty. We have to figure out a way to spend the money better. And what we need to do is we need to tell our leaders, our elected leaders, that we need to operate more effectively and efficiently. And this is why we suggest that you vote no on Prop 15. But thanks, Teresa. Really appreciate it. Thank you. Thank you to both of you for being here. Um, did we want to entertain a motion to uh, present a recommendation to the Board of Directors for the Chamber to support or oppose this proposition. Brett? Teresa, let me weigh in on that. Yeah, um, the Chamber's um, Board of Directors will be taking this up and uh, because obviously it does have uh, a direct impact on business um, and uh, it, certainly not required that we get a recommendation one way or another from this body, but if there were somebody after this wonderful, robust discussion on the pros and cons and wanted to make a motion and this body was going to support a motion one way or another, I would be happy to take that to the board. Great. So we can call- Teresa and, and Brett, do you guys want, do you guys want, uh, want me off? Um, Thank you for being here. Yes, you're, you're welcome to leave. You can stay as well. Um, but you're welcome to leave. Thank you. Well, if folks are open to my staying, I'd, I'd be happy to stay. I just didn't want to, didn't want to make anybody feel uncomfortable with, uh, no, with one. You're one. Fine. You're fine, Haney. Um, we're going to ignore you and Ben now, whether you stay or come. Okay. Okay. Thank you. Okay. Great. All right. So we've had the discussion and we're open to somebody making the motion. Catherine. I'd like to make a motion that we recommend to the board for Proposition 15, no, um, at this time. And we have a second. Is that Matt's hand? I'm sorry, if you, if um, that was a second from you, Matt? Honored, yeah. Okay, great, just checking. Uh, discussion? Is, no? 
Okay, because I thought I saw another hand, but I'm just trying to look at all the squares at once. I'll say I want to add one thing to the discussion. Um, well, I, I respect that it's probably true what Ben said, that there's a lot of properties, commercial properties owned by out-of-staters. We also have direct knowledge of properties owned by, by people in our own community who own commercial property. And um, we've had firsthand reports from folks uh, in those situations that their tenants, if this are to pass, are going to uh, are going to experience substantial substantial increase in their rent because these costs will have to be passed on. And so I only offer this because we're in the discussion phase of a of an active motion. I didn't want to say anything before, but but it um, it's going to have a large ripple effect down to our members' day to day costs. Okay, anything else for discussion? All right, so we'll call for the vote. Uh, all in favor of the motion to present a no recommendation to the Board of Directors of the Carlsbad Chamber of Commerce, please say aye or raise your hand. Uh, I'm not sure how you wanna do this to count, Brett. Just uh, Haley, you count and when you're ready for the people who might be opposed to this motion to raise their hands, let us know, Haley. Okay, so this is, so just, this is a, if you're in favor of a no on Prop 15, you're raising your hand. Okay. Thanks. There's a bunch of people whose uh, who screens are not on, so. I don't know how we're going to count them. Um, okay, so now if you're <laughs> if you uh, if you are not supportive of of the no, thank you. I saw Jr. as an I for a no. So if you're if you're a yes on Pro 15, put your hand up. Okay, like two people. Shirley, are you going to vote? She did. Are you no on 15? Oh, yes. She's a no on 15. Okay. Well, then, nine to two. All right. Cool. And then, uh, so that, that will be the vote, again, with the caveat that all government official agencies and, and representatives will be abstaining. Thank you. All right. Great. Thank you for that really excellent discussion. I love that we were uh, that we were able to hear from such great speakers on both sides that had so much information and insight. So thank you for doing that. Uh, I know we're short on time, but we are going to get through uh, the government officials uh, presentations really quickly. And uh, I see several of you are there. Uh, we'll start with the top of the line, uh, Congressman Levin's office. Francine? I'm here, thank you so much for having me this morning. Um, as you know, Congress was in session last week, so the, a lot has been going on. Um, just locally, um, a few things a congressman did la this past month. He hosted a roundtable with local restaurant owners um, to discuss this restaurant bill that he has co-sponsored, and he brought in Representative Blumen uh, Blumenauer, who is the uh, sponsor. This would provide about $120 billion fund for individually owned, privately owned restaurants to get some relief grant funding to help them stay in business during this COVID-19. As you know, restaurants have been severely impacted by this. He also hosted a round table with tourism experts um, and uh, from throughout the region, mostly though in North County, discussing the impact that COVID has had on them and what the federal government can do to continue to try to provide relief. He also in, uh, hosted a round table, actually it wasn't a round table, it was a very private small personal discussion with uh, leaders of the African-American community and with law enforcement trying to take a one step forward in developing trusting relationships and how we can better serve our community um, with law enforcement. So those were all really positive um, steps that he took. He also met, had an, uh, a summit on veteran uh, suicide with the VA and other organizations. So right now, the big topic is whether or not the House uh, or Congress is going to be able to pass some sort of the fourth uh, relief bill uh, during COVID-19. In May, on May 15th, the House actually passed the HEROES Act that would have extended PPP. It would have had another um, 
payout of $1,200 for the payments for individuals. It would have provided eviction and housing protection, expanded tax credits. It would have done a lot of things. Um, I won't go through everything it's doing, but, um, but two of the things that were tucked in there uh, would have also provided more funding for post office, the US post office, which is very important to people. We hear a lot about people wanting to support the post office and also um, more funding for federal elections. Um, they, the House has been trying to pass uh, funding for election officials throughout the country to make sure that our elections are fully funded, safe, and um, transparent. So last week, the Senate uh, also introduced their bill. They call it the HEALS bill. It came with a lot of discussion among the members of the Senate. And right now, the leaders of the Senate and of the House are continuing to meet with Steve Mnuchin from the, the Treasury Secretary, trying to hammer out this bill. Unfortunately, the PPP, um, the extra $600 unemployment benefit did expire. About 20 million Americans will lose that benefit. And so they're trying to work out a system where that will, they'll be able to continue to provide more support for unemployed Americans, in addition to all the other things that were in those uh, relief bills. So a couple of things locally that passed, um, the House passed the Bipartisan Water Resource Development Act bill. Basically, these are uh, bills that would uh, provide funding for developments that partner with the Army Corps of Engineers. Congressman has worked really hard this year, and we have three projects that were approved, two in Oceanside, the San Luis Rey River Flood Protection Project, and the um, Oceanside Special uh, Shoreline Study, are projects that have been pending for many, many, many years, and uh, these have now been included in this bill, which will bring funding to Oceanside to move these projects forward, in addition to the bill that was passed to um, shore up the bluffs in uh, Del Mar, uh, where the rail corridor runs along the bluffs there that is a very important to the entire region. It's one of the most, the busiest rail corridors in the country. Um, going along with your previous speaker for the, there was um, a funding package that included uh, an amendment that the congressman um, proposed for the Nuclear Regula Regulatory Commission that would require that they have inspectors on site while the, the nuclear spent fuel is being transferred. Um, as your speaker mentioned, they only have one more to transfer, but there are uh, many other power plants, nuclear generating stations in the country, and this would require that there be an inspector on site while that the fuel is being transferred. Um, he also was able to include, and it passed a $27.5 million um, toward a study of how to move uh, interim storage nuclear waste. So um, again, that's part of his larger project that you all know he did with the Songs Task Force. It's one of the recommendations that has been in there and you're all welcome to read the Task Force recommendations for more work that they did um, on that. Uh, there was also a uh, more bipartisan uh, Princey, provision. I'm sorry, we're running. We have one minute and we have like five more speakers. Okay, um, uh, let's just say he brought in $105 million, basically uh, work for Camp Pendleton that was in another bill. And um, he also helped pass uh, two of his veterans bill passed out of committee. And he's continuing with his town hall meetings uh, one uh, Wednesdays. Um, and his August constituent of the month is a uh, coach at um, Oceanside High School. So that'll conclude mine. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you. I know we just spent so much time on the other discussions, but they were worth it. Um, Matthew Five, will you speak on behalf of Senator Bates? Yes, uh, good morning, everyone. Uh, the legislature continues to be obviously remote. Uh, we're keeping one person uh, in our offices at all times just to be safe. Um, and uh, right now, obviously, I told you before, the Senate definitely um, pared down their legislative packages a lot uh, just due to uh, the COVID situation. We're hoping that the assembly side will do that. Right now we have quite a bit of their legislation. Um, so we're hoping they'll pare that down a little bit. Um, and they're still working on all of the issues related to um, how things are gonna work um, and how we're gonna get back to the Capitol and make sure uh, we keep everyone safe, but also uh, conduct all legislative business. Um, on the legislative side, um, Senator Bates, um, uh, just had an announcement about uh, that healthcare services um, announced an additional 320 drug disposal bins um, that are now available, uh, many of them throughout San Diego and Orange counties. I'll put a link in the um, chat 
uh, but uh, this has uh, been an issue that the center has been passionate about um, to cut down on the um, unwanted uh, prescription drugs that may be out there um, that can fall into the wrong hands. Uh, so these places that you can take them um, and safely dispose of them. Uh, finally, I just wanted to add to the great discussion on Prop 15. Um, it's often said uh, this state certainly does not have a revenue problem, but has a spending problem. Uh, we have seen that through the last several years. Um, even during good economic times, the state continued to spend more and more and more. Um, and now they want uh, businesses to pick up the tab and pick up the bill, and that's unacceptable. Uh, so I hope everybody keeps that in mind. Um, and <clears throat> if you have any questions or need any help through our office, we are here to serve um, with state agencies. I'll put my contact info in the chat. Thanks. Thank you very much. Um, moving on to Assemblymember Tasha Werner Horvath's office. I don't see anyone. I, I don't see anybody from Supervisor Jim Desmond's office right now. Okay, moving on to the city of Carlsbad, Jason Haber. Hey, good morning, everybody. Um, we have no shortage of uh, activity going on with the city. My update will just be about 45 minutes. Um, <laughs> no, sorry. Okay. Um, well, so um, obviously COVID-19 response is um, top of mind around the city. Um, if you're not uh, subscribe to the city manager's update, receiving those. It's a really great consolidation of uh, information from around the county and, and as it relates to the city for COVID-19. Um, we've had agenda items related to community choice energy, mask enforcement, railroad trenching, traffic calming, uh, economic recovery, state street activation in the village. Um, we continue to, um, you know, do the day-to-day the -day work of the city and um, we're as busy as ever. So um, lots of city council subcommittee meetings going on, uh, work going on there on lots of different fronts as well as tracking um, state legislation that's uh, pertinent to the city. Uh, the legislative subcommittee, I'll just say, has um, taken positions on about 20 bills that are working their way through um, uh, various committees at this point. Um, primarily related to housing, public health, economic recovery, uh, public safety and law enforcement, um, and a variety of other issues. So um, I'll leave it at that. I know time is short. We're on council recess right now. Next council meeting, August 18th, 3 p.m. Thank you very much, Jason. And please feel free to uh, put your links in the chat box for everybody. Okay, uh, we had a few things on the agenda that it looks like we've run out of time for. Uh, Haley Wansley is going to speak about Marsha Acres on our next meetings agenda. Thank you, Haley, for doing it next month instead of this month. We, we still wanted to talk about job killer bills and the Carlsbad Chamber update. Do we wanna move those also to next month's meeting as we're out of time? And maybe just a quick, something super quick, Yes, go ahead. Like the chamber has been sending out a bunch of um, emails to us. Uh, look at the informer on there. There's the Small Business Comeback Act. So just kind of be proactive and look at some of the correspondence from the chamber. We're really out there on coalitions and just really try to make that taking action. So make sure you're, you're looking at those. Thank I'll you. I'll go really fast, Teresa. Um, uh, the, the main thing I want to stress is that we have our State of the Community um, event this month, you know, normally it would be a luncheon at the Westin and <clears throat> with the mayor, of course, speaking, the mayor will still be speaking via Zoom, um, but we have three different um, panel discussions before the mayor speaks that you can uh, choose to participate in. And um, the three choices are, there's a panel discussion on the state of education with our superintendent from Carlsbad Unified, Sonny Cook, Dr. Sonny Cook from Miracosta College, and hopefully the superintendent from Encinitas School District. All three will be in that panel. We're gonna have a, a panel discussion on the state of business. We have Kurt from uh, Legoland, a restaurant owner from Carlsbad, uh, the Jenny or her husband who own Black Rail, Tin Leaf, and Beach Plum. And then we're trying to get a third panel discussion, a panelist on um, boutique retail. And then our third panel discussion is on the state of healthcare in the whole COVID thing. We'll have a, a Dr. Ma from Tri-City Medical Center. We have a Dr. Eisner from Scripps, and we're working on a, a, a biotech uh, representative on the panel as well. So um, the cost is $25 to register. It's on our website. You can go to our website to register. Um, and, and again, of course, the mayor will be our keynote speaker. So that's August 21st. I don't think I said that yet. August 21st from 1130 to 1. 
um, via Zoom, but I uh, hope many of you join us. Great, thank you so much. It looks like our, uh, our meeting is, uh, is over. Our, last, our next meeting will be September 2nd. This meeting is officially adjourned. We'll see you at some of the chamber events and our next meeting on September 2nd. Thanks for being here. Stay safe. Mask up. Bye. Thanks, Teresa. Good job. Thanks, everybody. Nice to see you all. Thank you.